Solomon is a four and a half meter man eater, a saltwater crocodile, and he belongs to Rob Breddle. He lives in his wildlife park near the town of Ely Beach in Queensland, and is the largest one there. Rob Breddle has looked after him for more than 14 years now. 14 years ago, the wildlife authorities trapped Solomon because he was a rogue. He set up home near people. He was eating the dogs, and it was only a matter of time before he ate the people too. So, by chance, they sent him to Rob Breddle's zoo. Come on. I hatched Solomon from an egg and raised him in a farm for a year and then let him go into the wild. We did this with several hundred of them. By right, that should have been the end of this story. But 14 years and 500 kilometres later, I got him back. During his 14 years in the wild, Solomon travelled from Pompera north along the coast more than 500 kilometres to Bamaga, near the tip of Cape York Peninsula. He was captured here as a rogue. How do I know he's one of my babies? He took two weeks to feed after I got him. He was eating from my hand six weeks after I got him. In all of my years, I've never seen or ever heard of any crocodile settling into captivity so quick. In fact, other large crocodiles have taken up to eight months to feed and others have actually died without ever feeding. You might think that he was the only easygoing crocodile, but what clinched it for me was he had this toe missing. And that's the toe we cut off as a marking system for our free range crocodiles. So he's not easy going. <laughs> That's my bucket you've got there, mate. Come on, keep coming around. Come on. Come on. This is the missing toe, and that's the good foot. But that's not what Solomon's famous for. He is famous for something else. Three years ago, he tried to eat my niece, Carla. A three-hour plane flight from Ely Beach takes us to remote Pompera and the Edward River Crocodile Farm. Here's where it all began for Solomon, on the shores of the Gulf of Carpentaria, in the Edward River Crocodile Farm, back in 1972. Boy, does that bring back some memories. When we got here, nearly all of the crocodiles had been shot out. In fact, the river just down there, the Chapman, had one crocodile left. That was all. The most amazing thing is, if it wasn't for my father, who convinced the Australian National University to fund this crocodile farm back in 1972, at a time when it was thought that this sort of thing would be impossible, because so little was known about the crocodile, Solomon wouldn't be here today. You don't get one eye. No one Rob Breddle chases the protective up. female from her nest. January usually marks the beginning of the nesting season at Edward River Crocodile Farm. More than 150 nests will be collected, each containing about 50 eggs. Many nests are those of the females hatched or caught by Rob more than 25 years earlier. This is why crocodile farms work so well. About 50 eggs in this nest, protected from flooding and predation, nearly all of them will hatch 
and nearly all the young will survive. Now in the wild, it's almost the opposite. Nearly all of these eggs and young won't make it. Now, this crocodile here, if she lives for her 70 years, she will lay about three to 4,000 eggs. And in the wild, only three or four must make it. She only has to replace herself and her mate with a couple of spares. Three or four out of 3,000 have to make it, so yeah. You know. Otherwise we're overrun with crocodiles. Actually, it does me heart good to see this, you know, to see that all those years ago, 29 years ago, we started this and you see that many nests, you think, wow, you know. It's very satisfying, I can tell you. You know, we reckoned we were going to save them and I reckon this is the only way to go. I mean, farming's really the way to save them, you know, it really is. The success of the Edward River Crocodile Farm ensured the future of the crocodile in Australia. But no one knew this when Solomon was just an egg. Solomon was one of the very first crocodiles raised at the Edward River Croc Farm. It all begins when Rob's father, Joe Breddle, with the help of Ned Edwards and Stingray Barney, collect him as an egg during the first shaky year of operation. It's not long after Rob Breddle joins them for the next nesting season to help scour the rivers for the few remaining crocodile nests. At this time, the crocodile in Australia is an endangered species after the skin shooters have done their job. With so few crocodiles left, egg collecting seems the fastest way to create a large breeding population to produce the thousands needed for the skin trade. This is so successful that the farm secures its breeders and thousands for skinning in just a few seasons. For a young Rob Breddle, this is the beginning of an undying love affair with crocodiles and the bush. Tough crocodiles do not produce tough eggs. They must be placed right way up. Otherwise, the developing embryos will die. Stingray Barney has passed away now, but he's one of the last hunters to depend on his spear and his knowledge to survive in the bush. Canned food never replaces a good feed of flying fox or barramundi. The only way to hatch the egg harvest is to build nests. Incubators have never been used to hatch crocodile eggs and there's no electricity to power them. In 1972, a driven Joe Breddle is determined to make the farm successful and preserve the crocodile. He's determined to show sceptical scientists it'll work. In doing so, he lays the foundation for today's multi-million dollar crocodile farming industry. The technique works. Around 90 days later, open nests reveal the hatchlings. Part of this batch of 1972 is skinned while others remain as captive breeders. After a year, they release the rest to replenish the wild population. 1972 also sees the release of the very first farm generation raised to repopulate the wild. They're a year old and toe-clipped. This marks the end of the decline of the crocodile in Australia. It's their second chance and it works. They liberate dozens into the Chapman River to grow and spread. They're more than a year old. One is Solomon. Small as he is, his size is now the key to his survival. There you go, big fella. Huh. Sitting next to the gate. Let's go over the top, eh? Urgh. 
when it comes to playing with crocodiles, size is really important. Because the bigger they are, the easier they are to play. <laughs> You can see when he came around, he was about one bucket away. And he just got a bit closer then. But when they're like this, size does matter, people. When crocodiles get over a certain size, they can't suck their toe anymore. So where I am is quite safe. Like I see, one bucket away is what it is. <laughs> and one bucket width is important. It's a matter of getting or not being got. If you're going to do this, always measure your crocodile first. Make sure he is longer than three and a half metres, because around three and a half metres he can actually bite his back leg. Over three and a half metres he can't. He can only get one bucket away. Starting to wear out, aren't you, mate? When Solomon was caught, he was about the size of this one. In fact, king of the river. He had most of the territory and most of the females. When it was born, he was only half the size of this one here. And he was about as thick as my thumb. And anything that could swallow my thumb could eat him. The first few months of life for hatchling crocodiles are tough. No matter where they hide, something bigger than them is sure to be looking for a meal. But even here, predators exist who find mangroves little obstacle to the hunt. Water pythons easily prey on the annual harvest of the baby reptiles. The weak and the sick are first victims. Survival strategy for hatchlings is simple. Stay hidden and stay still. The smallest movement will attract attention. Birds, fish, snakes and other crocodiles prey on hatchlings if they find them. A single river system may contribute many thousands annually and few ever survive. But they still have to move. They still need to hunt to eat. Food for baby crocodiles is as simple as it gets. The only things small enough to eat are insects and baby fish. Each day of their life is a lethal game of hide and seek. Movement means two things. There is something to eat, or something to eat them. 